These were days when history changed its course. The sit-down strikes began on December 30th. They began with the attempt of GM to move the dies at Fisher No. 1 to Grand Rapids and elsewhere. They have no idea what it was like to, to have to work along a line in, in the shop. It was hard, hard work. And then you didn't get no overtime. And if you worked it over, it was just your straight regular time. Of course, the women weren't allowed to work any overtime, but the men, they could work overtime, but wouldn't get no extra pay for it. It was hot in the summer, cold in the winter. Uh, you couldn't always uh, take time off if you need to go to the bathroom. And I remember in 1936, uh, before the strike, it was very, very hot. And down in uh, the Chevrolet, there were people who were dropping over because of the heat. And the other workers were told, just step over them until we can get them out of the way. They didn't, turn, they didn't slow down the line. They didn't stop it. And they just dragged people away. It was terrible. And I think that's one thing that really helped bring on the strike. On January the 4th, the union submitted a complete list of grievances. We asked for a national General Motors agreement, for day rates and the abolition of the hated piecework system, for seniority, for recognition of the union, for control of speed up, for grievance procedures, for the reinstatement of all the men who had been fired for union activity and for a 30 hour week. GM said no to everything. Widely separated workers, workers who didn't know each other, workers who didn't know each other's names, men who had been divided, weak and oppressed, came together in union and in solidarity. The union spokesman was John L. Lewis. Reporters from all over the world converged on Flint. Flint, the General Motors factories where the workers were sitting in, had become a stage which the workers of the world, wherever they were, were watching intently. Extra editions of papers came out on Flint developments in Paris, in Rome, in London, Calcutta, Buenos Aires. Well, the men stayed, but the women had to go out. We couldn't stay. I remember my dad calling home a few weeks into the strike and saying to my mother, Ida, we're having trouble keeping some of these young fellows in, in here. Uh, they're threatening, uh, their wives are threatening to divorce them or they want them home and the guys want to get home naturally. And uh, she said, Jay Green, if you come out, I will divorce you. I know there's one guy that he had five kids and he'd, he'd get so nervous he'd pass out because he had five kids and he didn't know he was going to get a job or not, get a job back. It was a bitter winter in January. Flint was the Valley Forge of the people who work in the plants. These were times when the summer soldiers fell away and the winter soldiers stood up in a terrible trial. Armchair generals and colonels were demanding that the National Guardsmen go into those plants and shoot the sit-downers out. But for once, the National Guard truly maintained law and order. The strikers were disciplined, but the Flint City government was the General Motors government after all, and General Motors insisted, so the police tried to evict the sit-downers. This is not vandalism you see there. They are breaking these windows to let the air in and to let the tear gas out. the sit-down strike in tear gas and blood as if it were a kind of 13th century peasants revolt failed. There were casualties. We didn't know what was going to happen. We, and then of course when the National Guard was called out, we were scared to death that they were going to maybe shoot down the workers, the, the, the strikers. But it didn't. We had a good governor and uh, he sent the National Guard in to protect them. We will work our way out of this strike peacefully and without injustice to anyone. And I am confident that after it's all over with, there will be a better understanding between employer and employee. And better still, I hope that conditions will be improved under which men and women labor and live. 
The sit-down strikes reached their climax at the beginning of February. Governor Murphy had been in office just one month. General Motors had tried everything, spies and intimidation. GM had taken his case to court before a judge who was a GM stockholder. The corporation had applied pressure on Governor Murphy. It had tried evicting the strikers by force. But not for a moment did the or the discipline of the strikers waver. Their wives and their children came to the factory windows. The troops, there to maintain order, not to shoot strikers, bivouacked in the streets. The strike came to an end on February 11, 1937. Governor Murphy announced the settlement terms. For a period of six months, General Motors would not, without the governor's permission, deal with any employee spokesman except the UAW and the 17 plants that had been struck. In the other plants, the union would be dealt with as representatives for its own members. No discrimination against union people. All strikers would be rehired. Union members could talk about the union during lunch and rest periods. All court proceedings against the union and its members to end. The company would begin to negotiate with the union in good faith. It was a magnificent and historic victory. Well, it made a company give us a better feeling. <laughs> And for, for black people, uh, we got jobs that we didn't get before because most of the time we were just sweeping the floor. But after that, we all went on machines and everything. People need a union. That's the main thing because you can't survive too long without a union and, and really live a decent life. Kids just don't have any idea what it was like. But I'm afraid someday they're going to find out because they're being hired at a far lower wage, and uh, a lot of them have student loans to pay off. Uh, it's going to take a, a lot of money for that. And I don't know how they're going to uh, buy a house, for instance, or have a family and have all this debt over their heads. It's not going to be easy. The people will have a union to hang on to it because you can't be without one. If you don't, you get somebody there <laughs> whipping you. Make you work, you know, and you know, no representation of how it is. No representation, they, they take advantage of you. General Motors workers in Flint get the news of the settlement, and the celebration is spontaneous. The flag tells you how the people feel. They have just won back one of their constitutional rights. Home is the sit-down. After the long, patient struggle in the factory, the men go home. What these people are celebrating deep into the night is the end of an impossible and unbearable subjection. Unions have brought wage earners so much security and freedom and dignity that it isn't easy even to recall the terrible oppression that came to an end with the winning of the zip-down strike. Well, it made a middle class. We could have decent food. We could live in a decent place. Uh, we could wear decent clothes. We could relax which we just couldn't before. We were always on edge, it seemed, that uh, if you're hungry sometimes, that's not good. And I remember being hungry sometimes. People were able to buy homes, uh, hold their heads high, have self-respect, which we didn't always have before. <laughs>